Oh, perfect. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so yeah, thank you for having me. My name is Matt Howard. I'm the chief marketing officer for a company called Sonotype. Uh, and I wanted to um, sort of be transparent about the fact that I'm a purveyor of counterfeit photographs designed to make me look tall and buff. And I'm ashamed to admit that I'm not a developer, um, but I'm here today to share with you uh, an interesting story and some really compelling data with respect to uh, where we are uh, in terms of modern software development. So this is a picture. This is chapter one of the story. Anybody want to take a guess what this represents? Anybody? Good guess. This is Detroit in 1982. Um, and you might sort of say to yourself, what does Detroit have to do with software development? Well, uh, I'm going to tell you. Um, put things into context. So in 1982, Detroit, as an automobile industry, was uh, building and shipping 4 million cars annually. Uh, line workers were measured on quota, 15,000 cars a day. Uh, the incentives for the uh, line workers uh, were uh, very much about quantity and not quality. And any part would do in the supply chain, provided that it kept the line rolling. Uh, so this is chapter two of the story. Anybody want to guess what this represents? What's that? This is, yep, it's, a, it's actually Japan in 1982. Uh, and the interesting thing about this is that in 1982, the Japanese automobile industry had a very, very different perspective on the world. Uh, their incentives were focused entirely on quality. Uh, quality was built in from the start. It was not inspected. It was quality by design, T TQM. Uh, vehicles were, in fact, 20% better than domestic competitors. And uh, they controlled 25% of the domestic US market, and that was up from 5% in 1962. So in 20 years, Japan rose from the ashes of World War II and built what many would consider to be a dominant uh, position in the glo global automobile manufacturing industry. And it's a fina fascinating story. And of course, you, know, you have to sort of stop and ask yourself, how? Like, how did they actually do this? Um, anybody know who this is? Anybody? Demi. So, so the answer to the question is they did it with one person, largely the teachings of one person, and three very simple rules. Uh, the one person is Edwards Deming, uh, who taught um, uh, essentially supply chain optimization. And the first rule of supply chain optimization was you source parts from fewer and better suppliers. The second rule was you use only the highest quality parts. And the third rule was you continuously track and trace the location of every part through the supply chain all the way into production. So as we sit here today at, at this conference, and you know, all of us at, at some level are building software uh, for a living, it, you know, it's, it's what I'd like you to do is sort of sit back and ask yourself, uh, you know, just kind of imagine, if you will, making software the same way that Toyota manufactures cars. And, and what would happen if, in fact, you took that approach? You know, would you have automated quality standards, inventory controls, essentially QA that's built into the process by design, you know, five-star safety, uh, higher quality, lower cost, all of these great things, including orderly recalls as required. Remember, Toyota recently recalled four million vehicles for a Takata airbag and did so in the blink of an eye with remarkable efficiency because their supply chain is amazing. Right? And think about the context of a recall in that light and a recall in the context of modern software with a zero-day vulnerability and an open source component. You begin to see uh, some of the analogies. So as we kind of contemplate that reality, we, you know, the next thing to do is to sort of sit here and sort of you know, uh, um, ask ourselves a question. Are we already there? You know, where are we as an industry with respect to this transformation from the 1990s where we were generally waterfall native to the 2000s with Agile and to 2015 with, uh, you know, this continuous integration, continuous delivery, DevOps, everything, speed is of the essence, developers rule kind of world. Um, so, you know, a big question um, in today's world, you know, is software really written at all or is it manufactured? Very, very similar to how Toyota manufactures cars. Um, I would submit that we're sort of uh, transitioning from this software written by fingers on keys to software manufactured by component parts and machines, utilizing billions of parts from open source communities uh, to the point where it's not 
uh, anecdotal, it's empirical, 80 to 90% of every modern application put into production today consists of assembled component parts, and 10 to 20% is essentially you know, fingers on keys kind of code. Um, so let me put all of that into context with respect to some empirical research that we do every year. This is the uh, 2016 data. We're in the process of finalizing the 2017 data now when the port report will be published in June. Um, but uh, we studied uh, 3,000 organizations uh, last year and 25,000 applications as the baseline for this data that I'm about to share. And again, to put things into context, the software supply chain and the analogy that we just went through looks like this. You've got suppliers, which are the open source projects. You've got warehouses, which are the component repositories, the local caching proxies that sit with your developers where you store, organize, and distribute the parts into the development pipeline. You've got the manufacturers who are the developer teams themselves, and then you have the finished goods, which are the applications that are released into production. The first point I wanna make is that supply is exponential. Uh, there are 1,000 new projects created every day. These are open source projects. There are 10,000 new versions released every single day, and these, these components have a release schedule in year one, at least, uh, 14 times per year. And so this is module counts data. This is across ecosystems. It's just basically up and to the uh, right. Um, we live in a world which, you know, quite frankly, I think we are all, you know, very fortunate to live in a world where we have the opportunity to innovate upon an infinite supply of open source components. Um, oops. And not, is, not only is supply exponential, but consumption is as well. So this is the consumption side of the uh, supply uh, uh, um, analogy, where you can basically see um, this is uh, consumption of Java binaries from uh, Maven Central, from the central repository, uh, since 2008. Um, by the way, this is in billions. So you can basically see in 2015, there were 31 billion components requested from the central repository and 52 billion um, in 16. It's up and to the right. Um, this is JavaScript, NPM, up and to the right, more than 50 billion last year as well. So um, the issue is infinite supply, massive consumption, not all these parts are created equal, right? Um, some of them are healthy and good, some of them not so much. Furthermore, what we know empirically is that all of these parts age. And in fact, they age like milk, not like wine. They go bad, and they go bad faster than you uh, can probably imagine, and we'll share some data to kind of highlight that. Um, so this is just a simple graphical representation of, of, of you know, the last three years, 14, 15, and 16, since we've been doing the research. Um, this is open source components downloaded, the defect ratio, meaning this defect ratio is defined in this particular case as known security vulnerabilities. So about five or 6% of the open source components downloaded and consumed by a developer have known, con known security vulnerabilities. Um, to be specific with the research we did last year, there were 229,000 downloads per enterprise. Remember, we looked at 3,000 organizations. On average, they download more than 200,000 open source components per year. It's 5,275 5, versions of components and 2,071 unique components. So again, infinite supply, massive consumption. That's what's happening. Um, The consumption um, effect you know, leads to this. Um, in this particular case, out of 229,898 downloads, 7.48% uh, uh, had known security vulnerabilities. So that's essentially a software supply chain that has 17,000 plus uh, components uh, flowing through it into production applications with known security vulnerabilities. And so what this ultimately looks like Again, it's important to remember, we're not just talking about the public repository, which would be, you know, Maven Central or NPM or any of the other repositories that are out there. And we're not just talking about the local warehouses where you're storing and caching and managing the components in your development lifecycle. And we, we're actually talking about all the way into production. So they enter the supply chain, they enter the value chain here, they traverse the software development lifecycle, and they end up in production. Um, 
the issue that's sort of interesting to reflect on for all of us in this business is that newer parts make better software. This is empirical. Um, so what I want to do is kind of just highlight for you this blue line here, which is moving from left to right, is essentially representative of, uh, of an, an application. A uh, typical application today would have about 108 components in it. The majority of those components would be younger, call it less than three years of age, and you know some percentage on the long tail would be older, more than three years of age. And so 56%, uh, to be precise, of the components in this, this uh, sample application are younger than three years, 44% are older than three years, and as you can see, when you get to the older components, the defect density ratio goes up uh, by a factor of three. So younger components are healthier, older components are less healthy. Um, components grow stale, and, and so one of the interesting things about this is that um, using the two-year-old component, imagine having the two-year-old child running around the house, you know, needing to be fed, change diapers, the whole bit. Two-year-old components are highly active. They get released 14 times a year. There's a lot going on with that kind of a, uh, innovation. 9% um, of the time, two-year-old components uh, would exist on the latest version in the you know, 25,000 applications that we, look like we looked at across 3,000 applications. 9% of the time, two-year-old components are on the latest version. It's hard to stay on the latest version when something's releasing 14 times a year. Um, Interestingly enough, when you get all the way out to a nine-year component, a nine-year-old component, 20% of the time, the nine-year-old component will exist in the latest version. Now, you might say to yourself, well, that's not so bad. That's actually pretty good. The issue is that if you're running in production an application that's mission critical to your business, and you've got nine-year-old components in it, they haven't been updated for nine years. You talk about technical debt. Um, so we're seeing some interesting signs in our business. Um, you, you know, we provide a local caching proxy. We also provide, you know, metadata on top of open source binaries to help developers make better decisions with respect to the components that they're consuming in their applications so they can make healthy, quality, secure, properly licensed decisions. Um, this gold line down here basically shows, so, so caching proxies are growing in popularity. It's now a best practice with respect to developer tooling, in particular the rise of DevOps. But also now rising is this idea of the, the, the consumption of open source and the hygiene associated with that supply chain of open source matters. Um, you know, a great example, which probably mo many of you in the room might be able to relate to, is, is Bouncy Castle, a very well-known and popular crypto library. Uh, in 2007, uh, there was a CVE uh, uh, released publicly. The base score was 10, 10, 10. Bad news for anybody that had an application with Bouncy Castle in it. Bad news. Uh, fortunately, uh, Bouncy Castle as a project in the open source ecosystem is remarkably good. They're very, very good at what they do. They, uh, you know, in a zero-day scenario, they're very fast to provide a fix and, um, you know, move forward. So, so it's not so much about the project hygiene, meaning Bouncy Castle, it's about the, 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 the organizational or developer hygiene in some cases, because nine years later, despite the fact that Bouncy Castle made healthy versions available, readily so, and fast, you're still seeing you know, vulnerable versions of Bouncy Castle with the CVE of 10 being downloaded 5.8 million times. Right? So it's not so much the, always the supplier, it's sometimes the consumer that's making less healthy choices. Um, so, we live in a world where we have, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, infinite access to infinite supply of, of, of open source, which is a phenomenal way for all of us to benefit and innovate. Um, we also know that not all of those components are created equal, and there's an opportunity for all of us to improve hygiene and to make healthy decisions at speed so we can continue to innovate uh, with, with higher quality and less costs and better security. And so the question is, how do we get there? Um, our belief is that you automate, automate, automate. Um, you know, there's the 100-10-1 rule in every large enterprise. You've got 100 developers for every 10 IT operations professionals for every one security professional, right? So, so the key to this is to create automation and scale and, and machine automation and scale that works the way the developer works inside their IDE, with GitHub, with all of the tools that they know and love, uh, and, and, and you know, create a situation where um, you know, you're improving processes um, you know, with machine automation 
the uh, developer IDE would look like this. You know, um, you're basically sitting inside of, of, of your IDE. You have uh, contextual metadata that says, in this particular case, this is struts2 um, from, you know, uh, version 2.3.4. Um, oh, by the way, you should probably know that it has um, a, 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 a known security vulnerability with a CVE of 10, and your organization has determined that this does not fit with the compliance uh, with, with the desired guidelines for, for open source hygiene. And so this histogram over here gives you the ability to say, ah, this particular component isn't a healthy choice for the application that I'm developing very early on in the life cycle. So let me actually find the version that's healthier and upgrade to the version that um, you know, will we'll, we'll create better outcomes down, down the line. Um, this is on the back of a Jenkins. Uh, this is a Jenkins interface. So it's not just the developer in the IDE earlier in the life, ci life cycle making better decisions. It's on the back of a Jenkins, you know, CI, CD, every time you're going to do a build because, you know, you're doing lots of builds these days in a DevOps continuous integration, continuous delivery world. Um, you should basically be doing unit tests every step of the way so that the, app, the quality and the uh, hygiene of those open source components is being uh, uh, checked um, every step of the way, early, often, and throughout the entire development life cycle. And then lastly, you get the benefit of the build materials so that, you know, God forbid, in the event of something like Struts 2, which just happened a couple of weeks ago, you're not going to be left wondering where in the world in my 10,000 production applications if you're a large investment bank is this particular component residing. You actually have the ability to conduct an orderly and effective recall in exactly the same way that Toyota recently did with the Takata airbag, right? Because we're basically sourcing the parts, which are the open source components from the best projects, the best suppliers. We're sourcing only the best parts because we have the governance, the hygiene, the information, and the intelligence to do so. We're tracking and tracing the location of those parts throughout the entire factory manufacturing process all the way into production. And, um, you know, from our perspective, uh, we think this is... Um, you know, an interesting uh, place for um, software uh, to kind of continue to move forward and appreciate the opportunity to be here with all of you today and happy to answer any questions if you have any. So that's it. Thank you. All right, thank you. That was uh, Matt Howard. He's the EVP and CMO at Sonotype. Uh, Matt, thank you so much. I really appreciate it.